He was too strong for my wife to resist. And to be honest, she didn't seem to give a damn either. She was happily dancing with Nick when, after a while, she gave me a quick glance, waved, and smiled before heading toward the bathroom. Thank you to her, you, and that clown. I was able to dance with her instead of doing it myself. That seems like throwing plans out the window. I became irate, pivoted on my heel, and hurriedly returned to our table. The moment I arrived, the discussion ceased and everyone looked away. They were all obviously aware of what was going on. I was being made fun of in public right now by that idiot and my wife. Brad, hello, how are you doing? With caution, Tom inquired as he assisted Rachel into her seat. I wanted to lash out at him with some sassy comment about how his wife had treated him the night before, but the words would not come. I hadn't completely shed my nice guy skin yet, I suppose. I would need to practice that. Well, I guess it depends on your interpretation of okay, I shot back, eliciting a few uncomfortable giggles. Yes, that was really bad, Dot, but you two will work things out, isn't that right? You're not really considering getting a divorce from Lindsay because of this, are you? I reclined in my chair and looked around. There were many lovely women in the area, among all of the people present. How in the world did my wife decide on Nick Palmer? What had convinced her to agree to this? Why did she brush me off? Our children were growing older and more self-sufficient every day. They would soon be leaving the house. Grace and I had even talked about what we would do when that moment arrived, not too far back. Already a tiny part of me began to wonder what would become of our relationship. I figured that since we were spending more time together, we would get closer, dot. But then, like a sledgehammer, it struck me. Perhaps Grace didn't even have me on her list of things to come. I was the biggest idiot. I felt a wave of anger sweep through me, pushing aside the nagging sadness and disappointment. Everyone at the table had noticed my changing expression by now. They were probably wondering if I was going to snap or do something rash and stupid. Brad, comma, how are you doing? With a trembling voice over her shoulder, Rachel asked nervously. Four very attractive young women were seated at a table on the far side of the dance floor, and I noticed them. How come Nick hadn't pursued one of them instead? I gave them a long look before something suddenly happened. I started laughing out loud. The folks at my table leaped with surprise, and before long, my laughter had caught the attention of those in the vicinity dot. My laughter was so intense that tears began to fall down my cheeks. When I at last became calm, I smiled at everyone in my vicinity as I wiped my tears. I knew then that everything had changed in my life. I was free to stop being faithful because it was obvious that my wife didn't give a damn about how I felt. As I removed my wedding ring and put it directly into Rachel's open hand, they all looked at me in stunned silence. Dot, when you see Grace, give her this, I stated. I have things to attend to. I got up and said, that'll cover my drink. Then I tossed a $10 bill onto the table. Given how eager you all were to support Grace during her betrayal, the remainder of the bill can be placed. As I turned to walk away, I felt a surge of pride, ignoring the chilly looks and hushed whispers from people who were once my friends. Dot. For a moment, as I was leaving the club, I wondered what I would say if someone tried to stop me. All I knew for sure was that I would break the nose of any husband who followed me and didn't back off. My thoughts were racing. I'll go have some fun of my own if Grace was out there enjoying herself at my expense. I asked the young woman working at the front desk if there were any suites available as soon as I arrived at the hotel. Although she declined, she did let me know that the bridal suite was available if I needed a larger space. She continued by listing the features that came with it. I said, I'll take that. Sorry, but since it's getting too late at night, we are unable to upgrade your current accommodations. She said, dot, not a problem. I answered, I'll have the suite to myself and one room for my wife. The woman looked at me as if I was doing something nice for my wife, and I could tell she was surprised. She gave me the directions to the suite and the key card, and I just gave her a wink. Oh, and don't give my wife the key to my room if she asks for it. Dot. Please watch out that nobody lets her know that I'm still at the hotel. Should she ask? She appeared a little perplexed, but I spared her the explanation. I confirmed that my request was understood by the hotel staff. After that, I went back to my old room, packed up everything I owned, 
and threw Grace's stuff in the trash, treating them both as though they belonged there. I rode the elevator to the bridal suite on the top floor. The enormous space featured a jacuzzi on a sizable balcony with a view of the city. Just in case, I packed one of my nicer dinner jackets. We had gone to one of the posh spots in the area for late-night drinks. I put on the jacket and headed back to the club, making a stop at an ATM to get some cash. A group of people was gathered outside the entrance when I got there. I gave the bouncer a nod and strode to the front like I owned the place. He asked if he could help me in any way. With a smile, I gave him a $100 bill. Waving me inside, he smiled and opened the door. When I got back, my old friends were still there. I glanced around the room, trying to find the four beautiful young women I'd seen earlier. Fortunately, they remained seated close to the dance floor. Not a single guy in sight. A girl's night out, without a doubt. Exactly what I had hoped for. I started walking toward them when Rachel saw me and began to call my name and wave. She was speaking, but I couldn't quite hear her, and judging by the way people at her table turned to stare, it wasn't good. I ignored them and moved in the direction of the women's group. Why are you four stunning women sitting here by yourselves? I inquired. The taller brunette interrupted with a laugh. We are attempting to lift our friend's spirits after her foolish boyfriend left her for some skank. Clearly, the brunette was intoxicated. Exactly right. I would love to dance with your friend and make her smile if that is okay with you, ladies, dot. After a moment of shy smiles and holding out her hand to let me help her out of the booth, the petite redhead who had been stealing looks from the others followed me to the dance floor. Which is your name? I questioned Kara. I'm Brad, she answered. Who the fuck would dump someone so beautiful as you? She laughed as I made a joke. After the song ended, we continued to chat while we danced, and I learned that she was a local and was pursuing a nursing degree. Dot. We started a slower one and kept dancing, getting a little closer to one another. Kara inquired, Are you married? After some time. Brad? Earlier, I caught your wife dancing with Nick Palmer. She vanished with him after that. Have you noticed? It seemed like everyone in the club had figured it out, but she was unaware that I was already aware of it. It was immediately after that that we'd broken up. As the song continued, Kara smiled back at me and held me close. It felt good to hold each other then, having been hurt by someone we both cared about. We went back to the table after the song ended and Kara told her friends, I know, Brad should stay, but we said no guys tonight. I guess the brunette was teasing Kara when he smirked at me. We concurred. Playfully, she said, no men. How about if I make up for it by bringing over a few bottles of champagne? I made a suggestion. She hesitated for a moment, then grinned. Deal or no deal, she declared. Nick Palmer and his spouse had already departed. The other three girls loudly disagreed and moved to give me space next to Kara on the bench. Dot quickly, comma, the blonde seated next to me inquired. So, do you two have an open marriage? Without a doubt not, I answered. Another blonde spoke up. What then did she say? She remained silent. She simply said she was going to the bathroom, and then she and Nick left the club through the back door. The brunette yelled, What a cheating skank! at me. My so-called friends covered for her when I pointed my thumb over my shoulder and continued. I asked the women if they liked champagne at that same moment the waitress arrived. Everybody smiled. I decided to order two bottles of their priciest champagne when the beverages were being provided. The girls identified themselves as Samantha, Tina, and Lisa, and I introduced myself. With Kara, they were all enrolled in nursing school. Tina the brunette pressed me for further information after the champagne arrived. Dot, in light of this, how will you handle your wife? She inquired. From my perspective, we ended our relationship as soon as she left that door. I answered. Are you a parent? Among them? One inquired. Regretfully, I answered. A girl, age 13, and a boy, age 15. However, when they're on their own in a few years, they'll be looking to upgrade in the spouse department dot with her arm wrapped around mine. Kara practically yelled, To hell with her! Tonight is yours! With a round of applause, we toasted to that. The girls told me some of their jokes, and we joked together. They danced with other guys in each other while we laughed and drank. Kara, though, stuck by my side. The rest of the night, she looped her arm through mine dot in the latter part of the evening. 
Tina abruptly became serious, got to her feet and ran out. Everybody turned to see what was happening. Rachel appeared to be attempting to approach me, but Tina stopped her close to the table where my former friends were seated. It was obvious they were having a heated argument, even though we couldn't hear what they were saying, Dot. When Tina began jabbing Rachel in the chest and yelling directly into her face, things got heated. Rachel sobbed and took a seat while Tina, who was still furious, threw her rage at the entire table. My former friend's humiliation amused everyone in the vicinity. Samantha and Lisa gave Tina high fives when she returned. After taking a sip of her champagne, Tina grinned at me and declared, They're not going to be around this table anymore. I pivoted to gaze upon their table. Everybody was standing, preparing to go. Chris and Rachel were both crying, and none of them even looked our way. How were you aware of this? I inquired with Tina. I made sure she understood how I feel about people who support cheaters when I saw her gathering the courage to come talk to you. I answered, You really stir the pot. They were definitely hoping that I would forgive Grace so they could feel better. I told you I owed you a kiss for that. Kara pulled me in close and said, Oh no, you don't, before I could lean in. The other girls cheered before she planted a long, wet kiss on me. Finally pulling away, Samantha yelled, You two, get a room! I said, Well, actually, you ladies don't seem to be in any condition to drive, and I do have a suite at the hotel just down the street. We can order more champagne if we move quickly. The four of us, Kara still clinging to my arm and the other three clinging to us for balance, headed to the hotel after paying the bar tab dot the girls started giggling as soon as they heard the word bride suite. So I ordered four bottles of champagne to be brought up during the upward elevator ride. Kara didn't let go of my arm even though she turned red as a beat when they started singing the wedding march. You have to carry your bride across the threshold, one of the girls said, laughing as we got to the door of the suite. Dot Kara said, you don't have to if you don't want to as she raised her big, gorgeous eyes to me. However, I unlocked the door, took her in my arms, and brought her inside. The others laughed as Kara put her arms around my neck and planted a kiss on me as soon as we stepped inside the room. The jokes were short-lived, though, as Tina noticed the jacuzzi outside on the balcony, and soon the three of them were relaxing in it. Dot Kara smiled up at me as I set her down and she held my hand. Just then, there was a knock on the door. The champagne had arrived on room service. The girls were still laughing as we carried the bottles outside to where they were splashing around in the jacuzzi. You're wearing too much clothing. Lisa made fun of it. Why don't you undress and come hang with us? I laughed and promised to stay with Kara Dot. They motioned for her to come along, but all she did was smile, grab my arm, and yank me back into the suite. As soon as we entered the bridal bedchamber, laughter could be heard throughout the space as we became comfortable with one another. I woke up in the morning with Kara at my side and the other three women across the large bed dot. It seemed that Kara and I had crawled into bed at some point after I must have fallen asleep. I silently slipped out of bed and Kara grinned at me. Brad, how was your fun? She inquired. Yes, exactly, I answered. Best night of my life. Do you regret anything? She asked. Not at all. We continued to laugh and spend time together in the shower after I said that dot. It was clear the others had woken up when Kara and I emerged from the shower. Despite appearing somewhat inebriated, they appeared cheerful as they relished room service and sipped mimosas. I'm eager to get into that shower. It sounded like the best one ever thanks to you. As Tina spoke, the three girls erupted into giggles. After that, all I could do was smile at Kara dot. After taking turns in the shower, the others eventually left together, aside from Kara, on the way back to her home by car. She cuddled up to me and said, I know it was terrible what your wife did, but maybe you two could work things out. I hope to see you again if not. She smiled at me, full of hope, Dot. That sounds fantastic. I'm not going to continue living with my wife, Kara. I thoroughly enjoyed my time with you, and right now you're exactly what I need. If you think we can work something out, give me a call. Kara opened her door to a kiss from me, and Tina, who was seated on the couch, waved and grinned as I walked away. Dot, as I was leaving, I realized that I had been putting off making a decision regarding Grace. At the club, my response to her betrayal had been impetuous, but it didn't make any changes. When I eventually arrived home, it definitely helped.
I didn't even bother to turn on the lights before collapsing into the living room chair. I sat there in the dark, trying to think of a way to get out of this bad marriage that would leave my kids as unharmed as possible. After a little while, I heard the familiar click of a key in the door and the sound of a car pulling into the driveway. Brad? I'm at my house, Grace called out, her voice sounding exactly like her own every time she returned from running errands. She entered, closed the door, and turned on the light. I gave her a look. Dot. She had the same appearance as the previous evening. She was still perfectly hugged by that blue dress. Her face remained the same, her posture remained unaltered, and her hairstyle remained the same. Even her fingers rings. Nothing had changed. She appeared to have spent the previous night with someone else. That is not possible to be true. I believed there ought to have been some indication of shame or guilt, dot, however comma nothing was present. I'm still here. She smiled subtly and said, the same old me. Naturally, she was aware of my thoughts. Nothing has altered. I still love you with the same intensity as I did yesterday, I said, my voice hollow and lifeless. Today. Brad, I'm happy that you feel that way, she began, but I interrupted her by gesturing to the bedroom dot, proceed to shower. I jerked my head toward our room and said, blank. I looked at her blankly after that. I mean, what more could be said? I gestured to the bedroom repeatedly until Grace finally gave in. Brad, where are my clothes from? She asked as she made her way downstairs from her shower the previous evening. I guess they're still at the hotel where you left them, I shot back. Dot, my clothes are still there, right? Startled, she inquired. Yes, I replied. Have you forgotten anything significant? Grace gave the impression that she was about to argue, but she stopped herself when she realized that if she persisted, she would have to call me rude, which would have sounded absurd at the time. She let out a long sigh. The confession then came out in full. Nick Palmer was the one dot she started. He's well-known, wealthy, and free to choose any woman he pleases. I agreed to dance when he asked. I was the most unique girl in the room, I thought. He gave me a sense of importance. She was reliving the memory, her face still glowing from the night before, observing her enjoy those times. It dawned on me that this was it, Dot. She would never value anything between us as highly as those brief encounters with Nick Palmer. I was an afterthought, nothing more. Do you still love him now? I inquired. I never loved him, no. Just a crush existed. Brad, I adore you, she persisted. Simply put, you and I disagree on how to treat the person you love, dot. She gave me a look that told me she still thought her position was justified. My ego was too brittle to handle the situation, which was the issue. Horrible, given that she had crushed my pride in order to boost her own. I returned because I cherish you, she said it again. Has he proposed to you as a girlfriend? His spouse? I inquired. Grace paused, then blurted out, Of course not. Brad, I adore you, but all I needed to know was revealed in that silence. Grace, you wavered. That makes sense to me. You would be with him still if he had asked. She said, It was just one night. Only a crush existed. I interrupted her. I'm done listening to you dot there, quote, SS a lot on my mind. Take the kids to your parents' house for the week after packing some of your belongings. You will accompany them. But that concludes our discussion. Brad ignored her protests. No, I cut her off. You won't like how things turn out if you push me further at this point. She was silently silenced by my tone and the expression in my eyes dot. As soon as Grace was gone, she packed her bag and headed out. When she had left my life wearing that blue dress and appearing exactly like she always did, that's when I started my plan. I was aware that if I wanted to proceed, I had to make the necessary adjustments. I asked for two weeks off over the phone with my boss. I then went to the hardware store to pick up supplies, wood, sheetrock, paint, and two exterior doors after renting a moving truck. Upon returning home, I picked up my crowbar and set to work. I started by taking out the front door and the surrounding windows. I put in two front doors, the new one on the left and the old one on the right, and widened the entryway dot. After that, I installed sheetrock and framed the wall that divided the house in half down the middle of the entryway. I had built a duplex out of my house. Just like the original kitchen on the right side, I installed the new back door on the left side, which would be a part of the new kitchen overlooking the living room. 
I made the dining room into a third bedroom and turned the office into a third bedroom on my side, dot grace quote S side. The two halves of the house were almost the same when I was done. Grace's detached garage was the only obvious difference. Not a problem. I intended to construct my own on my side. I reset the door code and changed the lock on her garage. After that, I divided the backyard into two sections by erecting a fence in the middle of it. Dot every day, I formally had a duplex. I informed the children over the phone that I was occupied with housework. Grace would not stop trying to talk, but I was not interested in hearing what she had to say. I gave her another call a few days later. Perhaps, just perhaps, we could talk more this time. I hope you haven't forgotten about me. Dot, she inquired. I'm thinking about you all the time. Will you be taking me out to supper? No, I answered. Give up crying. I'm not asking you out, Grace. What do you propose? Then she inquired. More of a weekend getaway planned just for the two of us. I recommended. Really? She seemed interested. To what location? We could leave on Thursday and return on Tuesday, I was thinking, Dot. That sounds fantastic, I said. Is it possible for you to take a vacation this weekend? With obvious excitement, she asked. Indeed, indeed, just your passport and phone will do. When we get there, we can purchase everything else. I informed her that I had her book, the tickets, and the lodging. I reasoned that even though last-minute trips to the Bahamas are expensive, it wouldn't matter if Grace ended up divorcing me, dot. Besides, comma, she would get child support equal to half our savings. It felt like she was taking care of Carrie's half, I thought. I moved all the funds out of our joint account and into my personal account. I also made arrangements for that new account to receive my paycheck. I wanted to make sure I had cash on hand, but I wasn't sure if Grace would cancel the credit card dot in order to finish hanging the walls by last Monday. I put in a lot of overtime, sometimes working 16-hour days. The walls were all up, if not completely finished. By Wednesday, I had finished Grace's side of the center wall. Although I was aware that eventually I would have to divide the gas, electricity, and water bills, she was unable to stop me from using the same lines as me for the time being. I told Grace to bring the kids home that Wednesday night, the following morning. Thursday morning, I waited for them outside while I locked up my side of the house. The kids got out of the car as they arrived and looked in shock at the front yard. My daughter was the one who spoke first. What did you do, Dad? With wide eyes, she questioned. I built a duplex out of our house, I responded. How do you feel? Without a word, they stood with their jaws essentially on the ground. Rest assured, I told them. On the right side, I shifted your belongings into your new rooms. Grace was unpacking her bags in her room when I showed them around the left side of the house, dot. They were astounded by the change. Afterwards, we were all seated in the right side of the house's living room. Dad, this living room is way smaller than the old one, said my son Jake after taking a quick look around. Once again, I said, don't worry, before long you won't even notice the difference. In addition, I want to construct a garage here and install a swimming pool with a jacuzzi dot. The children smile at that bit of news. I said, all right, kids, time to unpack your bags, observing that Grace was giving me a look that suggested she wanted to talk. Rather, I accompanied the children to aid in their adjustment. I brought lunch, sandwiches from the neighborhood deli, while we were still unpacking, and we all ate at the kitchen table, Dot. My daughter Emma asked her father, What made you do all this? Nevertheless, it was obvious to me that she was holding out to see how her mother would react. It became evident after a few days that Emma and Jake sensed something wasn't quite right. Their mother had been dodging the questions, as they could tell. It's almost time for us to become empty nesters. I stated dot I quote M just preparing for the future because I realized that things won't stay the same forever. Emma answered, You could have told us first, Dad. It was our duty to be aware of your plans. It was actually your mother who had the idea, I remarked, giving Grace a sly, sidelong glance. Grace appeared surprised by what I said. How could you, Mom, make such a significant choice without consulting us? Emma made a demand. How do we feel? Do you even care? Jake continued, glancing at her. Grace moved uneasily, but said nothing. Finally, she muttered, I don't know, kids. I realized there was no turning back once I realized your dad was sincere about this. 
Grace hurried out of the room, looking like she was about to cry. Why is mom acting this way? These days, she seems to be crying over everything, Dot Jake inquired. I gave a shrug. I said, you'll have to ask her that. Prior to Emma delving further, I informed them that I would be gone for a few days due to a planned trip. I promised to check in each night. I then gathered my belongings and walked out. Disregarding to bid farewell to Grace, who remained in the bedroom, Dot, we departed after I picked her up from her apartment. One of the greatest weekends of my life ended up occurring. Traveling in first class, lodging at a five-star resort, and receiving royal treatment. We had even better days because of the sun, sand, waves, food, and beverages. Carrie gave me the impression that she valued me the entire time. By Tuesday, I had seen every inch of her amazing body, and we were on our way home with radiant tans. Carrie walked me home and gave me a passionate kiss on the door. Would you like to stay with me one more night? She inquired. I answered, I'd love to, but it's time to man up. It's your class day tomorrow. She made fun of it. At bedtime, call me, she said. I must listen to your voice before going to bed. I gave her a final kiss and vowed to keep my word. I was returning to the airport by car. I couldn't help but smile. On our final night together, Kira confided in me that she could see herself falling in love with someone similar to me. I saw Grace's car parked in her driveway as soon as I arrived home. Shortly after I parked in front in the hopes of avoiding a confrontation while I unpacked, my front door was knocked on dot you quote V returned, said Grace. Indeed, I answered. Is it possible for us to speak? She inquired. All right. What topic would you like to discuss? I stated. Is it okay for me to enter? She asked. No, I answered. I won't let you stay on my side. You're not welcome in my space right now. This is mine. After a moment of stunned incredulity, Grace turned and made her way back to her side of the duplex dot. We sat at her kitchen table later. She said, Brad, I love you and I want everything to go back to how it was. It is not going to occur, I informed her. Why not? She inquired. Because of things you've done to permanently alter my perception of you, I stated. This does not have to be the case, she begged. Yes, it does, I persisted. I will never do what you did, no matter how good it felt. However, I adore you. She said it again. I inhaled deeply as I attempted to gather my thoughts. Say we are going on a date, as though we were still romantically involved. You abandoned me to go out and spend the night with another man. You were still with him the following morning, Dot. Is it possible that they would have gone on another date? That was Nick, but I asked. Attempting to defend herself, she said, Brad. I answered, not caring who it was. Not me, but you decided to accompany him. Brad, I didn't choose Nick over you. She objected, saying it was only one night. You've had a lifetime to express your love for me. I was discarded the moment someone more well-known appeared. Do I now have to worry that you'll fall for every famous actor, athlete, or politician you meet? I asked. That is unfair. Her voice was soft, but firm. Oh, you want fairness now, I said. In an attempt to calm me down, you want a fair chance to minimize what you did, to scare me into prioritizing our family over my own suffering. I grabbed her hand from across the table. She gave me a small smile and held both of my hands while looking straight into my eyes. Grace, it's too late, I said, knowing that it would hurt her. I discovered another person. She withdrew her hands from me violently, as though my touch had burned her. I take it that after you left that evening, Rachel and your friends told you who I left with, the brunette with whom I danced, the person embracing me, taking over on the anniversary that you neglected. Then the words were spoken, changed, and discarded, and at that moment I knew that Rachel had to have sent you photos of Carrie and I dancing slowly and passionately together as though we were totally engrossed in one another. Are you understanding? Are you rubbing some 24-year-old in my face as a kind of revenge? With a quiet yet obviously agitated tone, she questioned. She's actually 21. We just got back from four days together in the Bahamas. You know that ideal trip that we've been talking about? It was amazing. As I said it, a big smile couldn't help but appear on my face. I had a great weekend and I wasn't holding back. Grace gave me a fierce glare her expression showing how angry she was, Dot. She was obviously enraged by what I had said, and I knew that my smug expression wasn't helping. 
I inhaled deeply, allowing the grin to subside, but Grace's anger changed, and I could see it in her eyes that a torrent of insults was about to fly. She lifted a finger to gesture at me and began to say something, but as soon as she saw my smile come back, she realized I already knew what she was going to say. Dot Grace paused her speech in the middle and exhaled deeply, shut her mouth and put her hand down on the table. I had never seen her do anything like that before. In silence, we simply sat there facing one another. She intended to criticize me harshly and put me in my place for the actions I had taken. But then it dawned on her that she had lost all the power she had in our relationship, which had been based on trust and love, which she had so readily destroyed for one exciting night dot. At last, Grace was starting to realize that what she was doing was costing far more than she had anticipated. She undoubtedly believed she was cashing in on a few chips from our years together when she made the decision to sleep with Nick. However, she was beginning to realize that she had taken a huge risk by betting everything. With her hands clasped on the table in front of her, she sat silently, Dot. It makes no difference, she muttered. You are still loved by me. Indeed. You say that again and again, I answered. Isn't your love truly extraordinary? After everything you've done, why would I value your love? It's clear that my love for you was meaningless. Why then should I care about yours? However, I do not wish to lose you. What anticipated did you have? You shattered everyone's faith in you, Dot, and continued to believe that we could just go on. You've been undervaluing me. You are no longer worthy of me. Grace appeared perplexed. I'm heading home. I have household chores to complete. I'll drop by later so we can eat dinner together with the kids. But please don't bother me until then. I got up and walked out, returning to my side of the house, Dot. It was so hard to leave Grace behind. Though I knew deep down that we could never return to that, I still wanted to hold her the way I used to. The Grace I knew as my wife was dead, never to be seen again. All we had left was a glimpse of what might have been, something that she had disposed of with such reckless abandon, not even regretting it, Dot. After showing the kids the new kitchen and explaining my plans to remove the back wall and install glass to overlook the newly installed pool, I brought the kids over to my side of the house. Realizing that this was going to be Dad's side, they both fixed their gazes on the fence that divided the yard. I also gave them a tour of my upcoming rooms. Dot. Why will the house be divided into two sections, Dad? Jake inquired. Since your mother's house will be on the other side and mine will be on this side, I answered. Are you divorcing your mom, Dad? Emma asked. When we ask her questions, she never responds. No, just getting apart. I assumed we could just divide the house since I don't want to be a weekend dad. Dot, you two can then determine which side you wish to stick with. Prior to us taking a block walk, Grace called us in for dinner as she leaned out the front door. We gracefully ate in silence, though obviously under pressure since we knew the kids were beginning to piece together what was happening. All of a sudden, Jake blurted, I'm going to dad's side. When he's done with my room, Dot Grace had a horrified expression. Brad announced, you're divorcing. We're not. It's merely miscommunication. It's not even something we've discussed yet. With a quivering voice, she answered. Emma slammed the table with her hand. Who was the cheater? I'm curious to know. Emma and Jake looked at Grace, then at me, and then back at her. Grace gazed at her dish dot. When she began to cry, the kids knew they had their answer. I informed them that their mother simply needed some time to herself. After assisting Grace in getting out of her chair, I led her through the hallway to her room, changed her clothes, put her to bed, and gave her a quick kiss on the forehead, the way you would after a bad dream for a kid. I shut the door behind me and turned out the light. I had sympathy for Grace, similar to how one might feel for an adult child who had committed a horrible crime and was now sentenced to spend the rest of their life in a form of prison. Even though she wouldn't be a significant part of my daily life or even my thoughts, I still loved her. I went into Jake's room and saw him texting his pals while lying on his bed. I wanted to know if he wanted to discuss everything. Not really, he said, shrugging. I pumped my fist at him and went to Emma's room. Why had she to carry it out? Dad, Emma asked. Her eyes were filled with tears. You'll have to ask her about that, I answered. Why can't you just let her go? She begged me with her question. I would never be able to forgive myself if I did. Emma let out a sigh. 
I know, but I still want our whole family to be together. Yes, dear. I will not, however, be sharing a room with your mother to sleep in. Before I went back to my side of the house, I gave Emma a hug and we said our I love you's dot that quote s how things continued to be the same. I kept going to work before the children awoke. Thus, our morning schedule didn't change. Even now, Grace and I take turns picking up the kids for sports, band practice, and hangouts. On Grace's side of the family, we also tried to have family dinners whenever we could. She made an attempt once a week or so to discuss the matter, but I would always cut her off and tell her that I wasn't interested. The other significant change took place during school functions. I lost my grace when I sat or stood. I would excuse myself to use the restroom and find another place if she came over. When I got back, I was never left alone, though. Eventually, one of the divorced or single women that we knew would come over and naturally inquire as to whether Grace and I were no longer together. I went all out the next month, buying new furniture, appliances, clothes, and kitchen cabinets to make my side of the house look like a slick bachelor pad. It included an entertainment system, a large TV, and a luxurious convertible. Grace asked me about our finances when she saw the car. Brad, is this all really within our budget? That must have been an expensive car, she shouted. My car was eight years older than yours, Grace, so, yeah, I required a replacement because you were always twice as car buying as I was. I thought I would make up for those years lost. I gave an explanation. Regarding the remaining new items, you weren't expecting me to live in a vacant house, dot, did you not? Additionally, regarding the furniture, by not requesting that you part with any of your prized possessions for my side, I believed I was being considerate. Well, I never liked your taste in furniture anyway, was her reply. That was something you had never said before. I answered, I wanted you to be happy, so I stayed silent. To me, it was not a huge deal. I paused to let that sink in. Forget about the money. My side will be too big for me anyway after the kids move out and the house is paid for. To make extra money, I intend to rent it out, I mentioned. Grace gave it her all for me. Tonight, someone is going to get lucky. Squeezed my shoulder and smiled. I have no complaints. I enjoy your new vehicle. She said, you look great in your new clothes and you've been working out. I'm grateful, but I can't claim sole credit. Kira assisted me in choosing the new furniture and wardrobe, and Jake and Emma talked me into buying the convertible so they could drive it. When Kira was brought up, Grace's hand left my shoulder as her smile vanished, dot. She muttered, I was just wondering, and turned to leave. Though I had no intention of showing off Kira, who had become a major part of my life, I became aware of how much of my thoughts were focused on her. Grace's emotions, however, were receding even more. Kira was staying at my house more and more, and Jake had moved permanently to my side of the house by this point. Dot Emma Kama, who had previously sided with Grace, started spending more time with Kira, and before long, Kira was like an awesome older sister to her. Kira soon began spending nearly every weekend and many weeknights at my house. Grace was polite, but she only expressed concern when I insisted that Kira join us for family dinners. She was clearly not happy about it turning into a regular occurrence. Grace cornered me on my way to work the following morning. Brad, Although I'm happy to see you socializing again, would you kindly refrain from taking your girlfriend out to dinner? We should spend that time with the kids as a family. She begged. I said, okay, I won't come over for dinner when Carrie's around, but the kids can come hang out with us at my house anytime they want, dot it, quote S, not just like that. She argued to Brad, this is the only time we get to spend together as a family, Grace. Actually, Kira plays a significant role in my life now, and I would like to see her in it more. It would be unfair to exclude her because she gets along well with the children. If her presence bothers you, I retorted, then you're leaving me out too. Brad, you always assume that having your way means being fair. How do I feel, though, says she. You probably felt it was appropriate to sneak off with Nick Palmer. She lost her temper. How lightly she thought she could play me was astounding, particularly in light of all that had transpired. That night you threw fairness out the window. Grace, perhaps we should switch to my side for all of our dinners if you don't like it, Dot. I quote LL also allow you to stop by. Carrie is a fantastic chef, she said, her eyes filled with tears. Grace gave in. I apologize for bringing it up. Carrie is welcome to dinner at any time. 
When the jacuzzi and pool were finally ready, she whispered. Jake cherished spending time with Samantha, Tina, and Lisa at his house. They were competing to see who could make him blush the most as they shamelessly flirted with him. Dot. But the true contest between them was to see who could fit into the smallest swimsuit. Ultimately, Tina was outmatched because she couldn't wear anything overly skimpy without running the risk of a wardrobe malfunction due to her full bust. Nevertheless, she prevailed when she planted a kiss on Jake's chest while they were in the pool. Ten minutes later, Jake was still in the water. Even though it was freezing, Jake's life changed in that instant, becoming more confident around women. Dot. He soon acquired a girlfriend at school. After that, his girlfriend was treated like the luckiest girl in the world, and Samantha, Tina, and Lisa stopped making flirting gestures. Although I never allowed Grace to visit my side of the house, I didn't want her to get in the way of my relationships with Kara and her wonderful friends. However, Kara graduated a few years later, and after dating for a while, we called it quits. Dot. Her expression began to change slightly, especially after we went to Lisa's wedding. I understood that given our age difference, it wouldn't be long until I was expected to take on the role of sugar daddy. I could tell it was a burden for her, but it didn't bother me. Not that there were any problems. Our bond was incredible. Every weekend we were together, Dot. When she mentioned moving in, I got to know the majority of her family and we occasionally went on lots of trips together with the kids. I would show her the ring I had planned to propose to her. Although flattered, she expressed her desire to experience family life. She never mentioned it even though I told her how much I'd love to start another family. I saw it clearly in her eyes. She felt torn. She was meant to be with me, merely not at the ideal moment. Regretfully, I began to experience what many women go through when they're ignored, as if I was a wonderful man. But it was insufficient in some way. I gently hinted to Kara that her list of demands was getting too long and that there was going to be a gap between us, especially when it came to our time in bed. Dot strong relationships are built on trust, and it's uncommon to meet someone who actually possesses it. However, just like with Grace, my success turned against me. Kara seemed to think that guys like me were interchangeable. I showed her Grace's ending and how it made her feel the same. Kara's statement. Never would I be that foolish dot sealed the deal on our destiny. Ultimately, I informed Kara that the door would remain open in the event that she had second thoughts. Perhaps we could get back in touch when we're older and the gap in age doesn't seem to be as great. I have no regrets about my time spent with Kara. She at least had the grace to take a seat and discuss things with me. Dot A's opposed to Grace, who silently stormed out of a club. I would sometimes run into Grace's friends, my old friends, and they would always try to talk me into making amends with Grace. I think that sounds good after hearing their arguments, but what if your spouse cheated on you? Based on my observations, they appeared to not only accept, but also promote cheating. Dot the fact that we ended up at a club where Nick Palmer regularly frequented didn't seem like a coincidence to me. Of course, my wife is the most beautiful person there, too. Months later, as luck would have it, I learned that the ladies had moved their girls' night out to a new club, where Nick Palmer also enjoyed hanging out without the wives knowing Dot Steve quote S colleague reported witnessing Rachel dancing with Nick and mentioned that Nick vanished not too long after. The women's group departed at about the same time. Steve's friend, though, missed Rachel's departure with the throng when the spouses addressed their spouses. They all insisted it was a case of mistaken identity and denied ever having been to the club. However, Steve's friend uploaded a photo of him and his girlfriend at the club a few days later. Dot Nick Palmer was clearly talking to the wives at their table in the background. They eventually gave in and acknowledged that nobody had left with Nick, but the situation didn't seem right. Upon revelation of the truth, none of the women would acknowledge who had cheated on Nick Palmer, refusing to unfairly criticize one another. That being said, it was already too late. Dot, after Rachel's name was revealed, confidence was irreversibly damaged. When the husbands got together later to discuss things, Steve provided the best summary of the situation. How long have they been each other's backup? They were so easy to lie to in our faces. Rachel most likely had previous relationships with Nick or other people. All the men in that room remembered the expression on their wives' faces when Nick Palmer came to our table that evening. Dot.
They had all heard their wives defend Grace's behavior, pointing out how fortunate Grace was to have that opportunity with Nick, following Grace's maiden girl's night out. Every husband saw a new high in their partnerships. A few months afterward, one spouse made light of the other. I'm at my breaking point with these silk sheets. I'm getting hives all over. They discovered that their beds now had brand new white silk sheets after comparing notes. They learned through sleuthing that the husband had upgraded four of his beds to white silk overnight. The tipping point was reached when each wife began demanding a different role during romantic moments. Cowgirl, as their husbands pushed up against them with their eyes closed. They were very clear about wanting love from below and that they didn't want the men to talk until they were finished. Dot. After Rachel spent the night with Nick Palmer, the husbands couldn't get rid of the feeling that their wives were having fantasies about him. They came to believe that their wives were in their own bedrooms, mentally reliving their encounters with him. All four couples filed for divorce in less than a year. Steve was the first to get divorced, and he later expressed regret to me for all the things that had caused his separation. Ultimately, comma, all of the husbands expressed regret for not defending me against Grace that evening. One even acknowledged that perhaps my wife and I would still be together today if I had stood up for you. Nick Palmer made the mistake of choosing the incorrect married woman far too frequently. One night, as Nick was struggling to get back up after leaving a club with his latest fling, a man wearing a ski mask threw him. Dot Nick screamed in pain as the man broke both of his kneecaps with a hammer and then stung his groin with a nail gun. Although the entire attack was captured on camera, no charges were ever brought. Too many husbands had the opportunity and the motivation. Nick Palmer most likely lost his ability to urinate normally as well as the use of his legs. Dot regarding Grace, our last meaningful discussion about each other ended when Emma departed for college. We had already gotten a divorce by then. I was living in a condo near the marina after renting out my half of the house. After Emma drove away, Grace lingered in the driveway and asked if we could speak. I still adore you, Brad. I was stupid, and ever since I've regretted it. I haven't even looked at or dated another man. I am aware that since Kara, you haven't dated anyone seriously. If you wanted to move back in with me, I would be overjoyed, only to watch how things progress. My wedding ring, which I had put on her finger the night we were married, was hidden in a necklace that she took out of her blouse dot suspended from it. She extended it towards me, anticipating my reply. You're still not sure what went wrong with you. Grace, may I ask? You believed that evening that you were trying my love for you. In actuality, though, it was always a test of your love for me from the beginning. But Grace answered, I really do love you. I am aware that you adore the concept of our relationship, dot. You, quote, reinfatuated with the ideal spouse, ideal home, and ideal children. You're infatuated with the reality that I never regarded you as a trophy wife or as a possession. That together, we made some crucial decisions. You fall head over heels for the fact that our infatuation was just as intense as it was during our courtship, despite the fact that it happened less frequently. Dot, you, quote, re-infatuated with the fact that I've always put your feelings ahead of everyone else's. I gave you financial security so you could do whatever you wanted, and you're in love with it. You're in love with the fact that I blindly trusted you, though, more than anything else. You no longer love me as much as you once did, because you are aware that no one else will ever be able to bring you the same level of happiness or love that I did. Dot Grace held up the necklace without flinching, her hand now wiped from holding it so tightly you didn't realize you had what you had. And it's vanished now. I will no longer be available to you. Furthermore, I won't give you another chance to harm me the way you did. I've always thought that the world is against us. But the night you sneaked off with Nick Palmer, you ruined us, Dot Grace. Quote S face started to fill with tears. I went out with Nick Palmer. How many times do I have to apologize for that? She cried. Nick Palmer was never the focus of it. Grace, you feel like you were so fortunate when he asked to take you home that evening. However, I was the fortunate one. When I was being told I was overreacting by your friends, Dot, something occurred to me. You were the reason we weren't a great couple. It was my fault. My love was too strong, not yours, which is why you left. I could never have done what you did, my love. The rhythm was my love. To the music that defined who we were, we danced. I saw Kira across the room as I sat at that table in a rage, Dot.
She was staring at me with sadness for my situation, but she smiled back at me when I smiled. I was reminded by her lovely smile that I was still a man and that I could find happiness in a different relationship. You freed me and opened my eyes that evening. That being said, I smiled as I got into my convertible and drove off. I couldn't wait to get home. Kara had moved in with me on a shoestring, having quit her out-of-town job the week before. She had done a fantastic job since then of letting me know how much she missed having me back in her life. It is lovely to have trust, and I realized now that our marriage had survived because of something other than Grace's love. I owned it. This is the following tale, Dot. My 29-year-old girlfriend eventually admitted cheating to me. Three weeks ago, she moved and packed up her belongings. I could probably write a novel about my circumstances because there were so many warning signs that pointed to this point, but I won't go into details here. This is how I discovered it. I've heard that one night, over a very insignificant issue, I got into a fight. Around 11 p.m., I went to bed, and at one in the morning, I got a message. For my former, while I was sound asleep dot, she declared that she was taking a stroll. When she eventually returned to our bedroom, it was around four in the morning that I woke up. I went back to sleep until I woke up later in the morning because I was too exhausted to care. Up until around one in the afternoon, she had slept in. She also purposefully avoided leaving, either by going back to our front door or by using the doorbell camera I have installed, probably to prevent providing me with a timestamp for her movements dot when she did awaken at last. Since her walk seemed completely out of character, I questioned her about it. Good things don't happen in the morning. She refused to tell me who she was with, and it was obvious to me that she was making this up as she went along. She later told me that she confided a little too much in someone's co-worker about how unhappy she was in our relationship, and that she felt obligated to talk to me about it. Dot, this guy reportedly offered to kiss her as he walked her home. Reportedly, she turned down the offer. She insists that this portion of the story is accurate, but by now, my faith was lost. Weeks went by, and whenever I brought up the story, she would alter the details and tell me she was returning home. I didn't think it made sense for her to go unless there was some sort of transgression. I thus persisted in pursuing the matter. I knew she was leaving when she told me one day that she had given her two weeks' notice at work. She made a mistake. She hadn't admitted yet, but she knew she should. However, after I took her phone and looked through it in front of her that evening, she eventually admitted to me. When she ran out of places to go after I told her to leave, she chose to backtrack on her accusation of cheating and claimed it never happened. You don't acknowledge something like that unless you truly do it. It turns out that it was an affair and not a one-time infraction. I might not even be aware of the whole story or the duration of this. I suppose I just have to go on and take the story she told me as gospel. However, I do have a morbid curiosity about the truth, even though I know it will only make me feel worse. To provide some background, our relationship was quite unique. Four of the seven years that we were together were spent apart by long-distance dot. There were times when we didn't see each other, but we made an effort to see each other as much as possible while we were apart, when we at last made the decision to live together and reach a compromise. She was quick to do this while living under my roof, so this only occurs a year or so later. It cannot be disputed. It took place while we were apart, dot, I quote V, given someone a lot of time and energy, and I never imagined that she would just give it all away in such a way. The one person I had the utmost faith in turned on me. Had she been dissatisfied, she ought to have left. I am aware of the struggles you two are facing. I hope we can all get better. Absolutely, you dot, yes. I hope she can perform flawlessly in front of you. And she can do it right under your nose. She is undoubtedly fleeing something by returning home, and she is unable to accept responsibility for everything. To be honest, it probably happens so often that she wouldn't be able to distinguish between all of the lies. Update. She confessed to me her desire to cheat on me. Need assistance in NSW? In any case, I made a post a few weeks ago following my partner's 29 woman affair revelation. The things she said to me still bother me. I questioned why she would do that after she confessed. She said, I wanted to cheat on you, without hesitation and with no mercy. What else would you like to know? She had added. I followed the guys after that, but time passed. 
After that evening, she informed me that her claim that she had hookups with other men was untrue and that the only relationship in which she had been unfaithful was with the partner in question. How poisonous can you be, really, to tell someone to intentionally harm them? Why even go to the trouble of casting doubt on me, particularly in the event that the statement was false? Call me outdated, but I don't think people should just openly confess to having several partners in order to annoy someone, especially if they weren't involved. I'm not sure if I truly knew her before or even now. Here's a quick summary. Swift in its execution. She and I don't communicate. I'm not on speaking terms with her at the moment. She told me this as she was preparing to leave and packing up her belongings. Dot. How harsh is that, oh boy? I apologize to the original poster. I believe she is expressing such sentiments because she wants you to walk away and put an end to it. She has weaknesses. She doesn't want to accept responsibility, as I mentioned. A bridge is easier to damage and completely destroy. And that is to own up to your mistakes and extend forgiveness. She is aware of her shame as a human being. Update. A year without speaking to each other. Things improve. NSW progress. Extended post warning. I've been successful in not giving my ex any life, and I haven't heard from her in precisely a year. Since dates have always held sentimental value for me, I can only assume that the milestone has a greater emotional resonance for me. Furthermore, I doubt she has thought about how long we were apart, given that I was the one who was duped and caught off guard in this whole situation. Dot furthermore, comma, I seriously doubt that she views this as a turning point in her own life. However, I'm not sure though some days I still can't help it. I suppose it shouldn't matter to me what she is thinking. It takes a difficult, drawn-out process of reflection to go this far without talking about someone you genuinely loved and cared for. Furthermore, being deserted under the pretense of adultery and deceit is a different animal entirely. Dot. My former partner genuinely abandoned me after discovering her extramarital affair in just three days. After packing up everything she owned, she hurried back to her home state. After the inevitable fights and explosions, I left her in silence out of respect for my own sanity. I blocked her on all the platforms that were available. Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. I stopped chatting to her on WhatsApp, SoundCloud, Netflix, and even effing Venmo. I went a step further and cut off all other lines of communication, including those with her close friends and family. I wouldn't allow her or anyone connected to her the luxury of intruding into my life. By all means, get in touch if you need to, but only if there's a chance of reconciliation. There's a family or living situation that needs attention, or you and your ex got along well, dot. If you were misled, deceived, abused, gaslighted, or betrayed into thinking that their bad stay was your fault, forever, no contact. Grieving happens in stages, as we all know, but a year later, I don't think they always manifest in that sequential manner. I still have days when I'm happy and days when I'm angry, dot. Some days I think I've come to terms with her being gone forever, and other days I continue to live in denial. Some days I wonder if she's thinking of me at all, let alone how she's feeling. Some days I just sit here and wonder if she truly regrets leaving me. There's even a dark, morbid hope that with me gone and her new life, she felt empty or like a piece of total crap, dot, that quote s how she made me feel after all. It's important to keep in mind that no interaction is personal. It's difficult to see yourself as a unique person after you split up with someone you can't fix. You're not dating. I've looked into a number of coping mechanisms for that new reality. I attempted counseling. Although the sessions became stale, it did help. I dabbled in some binge drinking, misbehaving, and even haphazard Tinder hookups. None of that nonsense will, I promise you, help you get over someone completely. You will always have some degree of love for someone. I've reached a point in my recovery where I understand that improving my relationship with myself is the only thing that counts. Acknowledging your shortcomings is also essential. I wasn't absolved of guilt or victimization, even though I was betrayed. I wasn't flawless either, and a number of my own shortcomings contributed to the breakdown of my previous relationship. In a relationship, communication is essential, and when it's lacking, it can quickly blow up in your face. I love her, and I will always miss her but I am unable to be there for her in person. I can say that things do get better. While they can be helpful, distractions are not the answer. Even though it sounds cliche, it simply takes time. 
Pay attention to your new life and yourself. Now a community perspective. It's time to disregard this date. OP, you've done a great job of surviving her thus far. Although infidelity is inevitable, you still need to move forward and strive to reach the ultimate level. The nation of May needs to address its apathy. You have to let go of the last remnant of her that is inside your mind. Dot that particular passage. I will always love her, and I still miss her. You let that portion go because it's so crucial to your future. It must be done on your behalf. For the sake of your future, you must act. In a year, you must be able to go through this day without giving it any thought. Dot. All you want is for Tuesday to arrive. Not as good as next Tuesday, but still better than Tuesday before. However, it was just another Tuesday, unaware that this would be the special day. It's true what the comment says. Considering the cards you were dealt, you've done incredibly well. Breakups are more difficult than ending a relationship, especially when they happen amicably. Dot. Taking things day by day can sometimes be the best course of action. You're correct when we do that. Things improve, and a good day is any day we are not with an infidelity partner. I appreciate you listening to the stories of today. If you liked what you heard, kindly hit the like and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Additionally, feel free to comment below with your thoughts on what transpired. Be careful.